Welcome to the College Savings Month webcast sponsored by College Advantage 529. College Advantage 529 is offered by the Ohio Tuition Trust Authority and is available to residents of any state. For 25 years, forward-thinking families across the country have been saving for more than 750,000 past, present, and future college students. With $9.5 billion in assets under management, College Advantage offers a direct sold 529 plan and an advisor sold 529 plan, which is managed by BlackRock and offered through professional financial advisors. To learn more, visit collegeadvantage.com. I'm very excited to introduce our moderator for today's event, Michelle Singletary, a nationally syndicated columnist for the Washington Post, who also hosts a weekly live online chat where she gives advice on personal finance issues such as raising money smart kids and the importance of saving and investing. At the conclusion of today's event, Michelle will be announcing the winner of the Kindle Fire HD7, so stay tuned. Thank you again to College Advantage 529, Michelle, and our three panelists for helping out with this important event today. And so with that, I'll hand it over to you, Michelle, to get started. All right. Well, thank you all. I wish I could see many of you, your faces, and I appreciate it. I heard that we've got more than 300 people on the line, so clearly we're not going to get to all of your questions, but we're going to try our best to plow through questions that probably impact many of you. Um, I'm going to have each panelist introduce themselves uh, and what they do, and then we're going to just hop right into the questions so we can get through as many as we can in the next hour. So I'm going to start with uh, Joe. I call him Joe, but <laughs> his birthday, Joseph. I'm Hurley from SavingForCollege.com, and I'll have to just say, you didn't pay me for this, but it's just one of the best sites. If you've got any issues or questions about 529 plans, it's the go-to site that I send everybody who asks a question about 529 cool. plans. So, Joe, do you... Thanks very much, Michelle. Uh, thanks for those kind words, and thank you for being on the, the webcast today. It's a, certainly an honor having you uh, with us today as moderator. Uh, yes, I'm Joe Hurley, and uh, I uh, am founder of SavingForCollege.com more than 15 years ago, and I wrote a book called The Best Way to Save for College, A Complete Guide to 529 Plans, which I think is in about its 14th edition right now. Uh, so yeah, a lot of my life has revolved around five to nine plans and college uh, planning uh, over the last few years, and so I'm most willing, and and I hope I'm able to answer a lot of the questions that come up today. And you should tell people you personally use them for your children. Is that not right? Yes, we have two children. Both have graduated from college, and at one point, we had 529 plans in 34 different states for those two children. And I would not recommend that I was to say. anyone. <laughs> you just I, did it for your research though, right? I, yes, exactly. I did it for my research purposes and I learned a lot by being in so many plans myself. Wow, wow, that's dedication. Um, so next up we have um, Jody Oaken. Um, and Jody, will you introduce yourself and tell folks a little bit about you? Yeah, hi, I'm Jody. Welcome everyone. I am the CEO of College Financial Aid Advisors. I'm also the past uh, consultant at Occidental and Pittsburgh College as a financial aid consultant there and I'm the hostess of College Cash which is every Thursday night Pacific time at 5 p.m. where we talk about the college process and financial aid. Great, well thank you. And last but certainly not least we have Aaron Green from College uh, Liftoff. You see a little monitor in the back. I didn't keep that because you know you got to have touch of stuff. So <laughs> Aaron, tell people a little about yourself. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, yes, here uh, I have an organization in uh, Columbus, Ohio, where we work with families and students on getting ready to go off to college, uh, academically and financially. We like to look at the best, how to get the best return on value for education. How do you really buy education in this market when it's going to cost you the equivalent of a house? You've put money away, you've taken the time to, to, to save, especially in the 529s, hopefully. Uh, how can we best spend that money to get the best return on the academic side, the career side? making sure it's the right fit, and making sure financially it, it matches up as well. Right. So we're going to be covering questions probably mostly about 529 plans, but just in the broad sense, uh, say for college. So I'm going to go to the first question that came in from Molly. Uh, I thought this was a good place to start considering what's going on. I've heard her on the radio. Stock market. Um, so uh, Molly says, I need money in eight years. How do I pick a plan with current erratic, erratic uh, market. So basically, I've got eight years to go. How do I save for my child in this uh, crazy stock market time? And I guess each of you actually could address this if you don't mind. We'll start with you, Aaron. 
Well, I would actually say, especially for younger kids, the longer the better. Anything that you can just start saving away for younger kids in 529 plans, always the better. Look for the states with the best returns, obviously, but also make sure you're factoring in the, the tax haven vehicles that are going to be in use for those states as well. Okay. So, Jody, they've got eight years to go. And they're like, oh, what should I do? The market's crazy. Oh, you need to save, Michelle. I mean, college is expensive, and uh, it's one of the biggest consumer products that families probably are going to be buying right now. So, as much money as you can save in order to, you know, figure out what what's going to work for your family uh, is key. Uh, Joseph, uh, what would you say to that? <laughs> Well, I, I would agree ent entirely. It's a great question, just because the, the markets over the last couple of weeks here have just been been crazy. But the good news is, you have eight years. You don't have to worry about what the market is doing right now. Uh, and 529 plans have this wonderful vehicle available to you called the age-based option, which uh, gives you a combination of stocks and bonds and money markets in your account that's appropriate to the age of your child. And so what that means is as your child does get closer to the college years, uh, your investment takes on less risk because it shifts automatically from mostly stocks to mostly fixed income securities, which don't have quite the ups and downs that, that, that stocks do. And so, you know, look at your own state's 529 plan first because you might be eligible for a special benefit in, in, the, in the form of a state tax deduction for your contributions. Uh, and within that plan, take a look at all the different investment options, but I think that for many families that don't really feel like, you know, they're, they're very sophisticated in investing themselves, the age-based option, which essentially is autopilot, uh, is, is a great way to go. It's just a great way to go. And, and for, for our two kids, we use the age-based place plan extensively, and uh, they each went through a uh, stock market downturns just before they went to college, but because they were in the conservative investments by the time they got to college, they were they were impacted very little by those by those recessions. Yeah, I have uh, three 529 plans because I got three kids to get out of my house. Uh, and uh, the first one is a junior at the University of Maryland and um, she got a scholarship actually so we actually gonna have some money left over to send her to grad school but we did the age base as well and it took a lot of the worry out of trying to rebalance a portfolio because they do it automatically so I want to go um, to Karen because this is sort of a, a dovetail on the question I just asked so we all agree you gotta say you gotta kids gotta say uh, but Karen wants to know how do I know how much to save per month and what I need for my son's college. So that's the specific question, because people ask that all the time, how much should I be saving? Um, let's start with you, Jody. Um, well, one tool that they have out there, which I think is great, if your student is interested in certain kinds of colleges right now, you can go on the net price calculator, and you can see what the cost of college is going to be, and then you can find out what, it, what you're going to be, what's going to be your portion based on your assets and your income and all the questions that they ask. So that'll give you the expected family contribution and kind of give you an idea. As far as, you know, before that, maybe Joseph or Aaron can kind of help with those answers, but I would say um, my favorite go-to is that net price calculator. And if you Where know do they the, find that? Do they just Google they net price calculator? Yeah, they can Google it, or they can actually, if they know, like, in their state, if their student is staying in their state and they want to do their state college, every college has one on their website. They do net price calculator of California State University in Long Beach and there you'll have it will be the net price calculator so it's a regulation for that calculator to be on everyone's website every college okay so Aaron how much is 200 too much five fifty dollars I only have 25 dollars that's <laughs> yeah. we always like to start with this conversation with budget uh, so let's look at it from the family perspective and really see uh, how much really can one they afford to actually put aside for college when we talk about college here as far as a cost structure we like to value it off of the the base of it off of what the value of the degree is going to yield based off of what the student's outcome is going to be. Long story short, what are they looking to go into? What are fields going to look like in that amount of time until your student walks out of college? Let's look and see what that's going to look like. Let's start putting money aside on the basis of that and understanding, well, we're going to pay a certain, more, uh, a certain percentage of your college based off of this, 
find schools and scholarships and programs that help fill in the gap along the way. And then we can do the homework on the back end with finding the schools that actually have those resources to make it happen. So using the, uh, the net price calculators to see how much college is going to cost for sure, but always, always come from the standpoint of what's going to be right for your budget as a family so that way you can really put forth the right effort toward it and that you're not overextending yourself. Right. Okay. So does that mean if my kid won't be a doctor, then I just basically going to be noodles? So <laughs> I mean, well, short, short, you know, you're in for a, for a mighty debt, but that's really going to come from the student, too, because it's that uh, student loan debt at that level is just astronomical. That's for a whole different conversation. Right. Joe, what, how, what do you tell people when they say, how much should I, they run a beast, they want you to give them a number. I think they, they, you, what do you tell them? They do want a number. And so I've come up with a number. Uh, oh, good. I tell I tell people if, if your child is a newborn, uh, if you can afford two to three hundred dollars per month in savings, that's terrific because the way things are going right now, that amount will pay for about one year of the, the average private college and two years of the average four year public university, which I think is a terrific goal. I don't think anybody needs to shoot for 100% coverage because many students end up getting some sort of scholarships uh, or, or financial help anyway, even if it comes from grandparents or other, other sources. So to me, that's, that's a reasonable goal. Plus, consider that as your child gets older, uh, you may progress in your job, in your earnings, and you may be able to afford more later on. So it's, I think it's incumbent upon just about everyone to start a 529 account and put in at least the minimum monthly amount, which is typically $25. Even if you're very, you know, if you're not able to put a lot in, like the $200 per month, get that account open, put in $25 per month. But if you can't afford that higher amount, um, you're going to feel very good about your college savings. Okay, so since I'm still on you, Joe, there's a question came in from John. Can you start a 529 plan when your kid just entered college as a freshman? Uh, you sure can. Uh, you, if, if you're setting aside funds to pay for the second, third, fourth, or graduate school, um, you know, that money's going to be sitting around for a while, and if it's in a taxable account, you're going to be paying Uncle Sam some of the money that could be going towards school. So by putting that into a 529 plan now, it may not be a huge amount of tax savings, but anything's going to help you uh, over whatever period of time it is before it gets spent. And the other reason, Michelle, is because if you live in a state that offers you a state tax deduction for contributions to a 529 plan, it doesn't matter how long that money's in the plan. You could put it in today and take it out in six months to pay the college bill and you've deducted it off your, your state income tax return. So there's an immediate benefit just by using a 529 plan, even if your child is a freshman in college, if you live in one of those states that allows that. That's a good, that's a good point. Um, so Jody, this is a question comes from David. Um, at some schools, you can get an equal or better education for less than other schools. How can one find those best buys? Um, I always tell my families uh, when you're creating a list, so if we were talking to students who are high school seniors now, you, you know, you want to create a list that's not just fit location as far as size, but you want to look at cost, you want to look at location, so you want to be able to have options for all the schools, so you have a good list, because this is probably one time or the first time that students are going to apply to some place, and some people are going to say no. So if you have a good list, then you're going to be able to find, whether it's a state school, the public school in your state, some private schools, uh, and then you'll be able to compare them when you get to that March and April and see what college is good for your family fiscally. Right. Erin, what would you say to that question? That, that's a great question. and that, This starts with really balancing an equation, really looking at how do you get this best return. We start with this whole thing with the career side. How mm -hmm. do we work with students on figuring out what it is that you truly want to do and go into? Um, this isn't the same college buy that we had when we were going to school. That this right. is a market where you have to be skill set focused on the degree. So let's do that first. 
then let's find the schools that academically focus and do those particular disciplines well. Let's actually find the schools that do that. Next part is matching up the cost structure. You can do that just by studying the numbers. A lot of these schools, that all of them actually at this point, are publishing all of their financial aid histories, endowment sizes, how much do they give in average financial aid packages and gift aid packages, in U.S. News War Reports and a few other sources. Those are something you can read almost like the sticker price at the grocery store. In this case, the sticker price of the school isn't exactly the right number we're looking for. We're looking for how much are they giving in grant aid per student. What's their average indebtedness walking out? You want to match that up with what the student's going to school for. Then the fit factor plays a role in that. Use all those pieces in order to make a good buying decision when you're looking for college. And that's what we approach. That's how we approach it with when we're working with our families here. Right, right. That's a good question. Um, um, Joe, I'm going to go to a question that just came in um, before we started. If, if there are multiple children, should the older siblings' assets be put into a grandparent's name? That's probably a more sophisticated question than most people are worried about because it's like trying to, you know, put things here and there. Um, I personally wouldn't put no money in nobody else's name because I don't trust him my family members. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being honest. <laughs> but what would you say to someone who wants to sort of what what's really at the the crux of their question? They're trying to do what? Well, I, I I think they're thinking about financial aid. Is there a way to hide assets from the financial aid application by putting them in somebody else's name and then taking them back when it comes time to pay for college? And I, I just think there's a, a, a very large risk in giving your assets to anybody else because you probably shouldn't trust them. Uh, anything can happen to uh, grandma and grandpa. They could, uh, uh, they could have huge medical bills and that money then is spent uh, on their medical expenses instead of college, or they could uh, decide to take a lot of trips around the world or whatever with, with that money. Just don't give your money to somebody else just for financial aid reasons. It's just not worth it. And it can actually come back to haunt you from a financial aid perspective because if any third party other than your parent helps you pay for college, you have to report that support as student income on the financial aid form, not on your tax form, but on the financial aid form. And that student income is a real killer as far as financial aid eligibility goes. So if there's money in the child's name, uh, uh, don't move it to somebody else, but think about moving it from a custodial account into a 529 custodial account because the tax law gives 529 plans better financial aid treatment when the assets are, are owned by the, by the child. Right. I'm going to throw my, a quick question in here because it's the, the news, you know, U.S. Uh, news World Report uh, rankings just came out, right? And everybody's freaked out about these rankings and there's all this talk about, does that contribute to the anxiety that you need to send your kid to one of these top schools? Uh, what do you say, Jody? I say there's a lot of buzz. I'm, I'm, you know, I say my phone rings. I say my email blows up, and parents are overwhelmed, and the conversation is started. And I think that the best thing that we can all do on the panel, and that we can do for families across the nation, is to be as transparent as we possibly can, to let them know that the money talk starts early. And to let your kids know that this is the how time. early, how early, Jody? How early well, should it be? I would be? say middle school. Um, I would say you know this is you know uh, we in the family are talking about college. We in the family are talking about maybe this is what you want to be. This is you know your career decision or this is your aim. And we in the family, this is what we have. And so with that said, I know it's hard, I know it feels uncomfortable, and I know maybe as parents in some way, shape, or form, we did the right thing or we didn't do the right thing, but we do want them to be capable at the end of college to be able to have a conversation on their own. So the more transparent that we can be, the more we teach them, and the more we teach them, the better that they'll be able to hand their, handle college. So. Uh, it's just, it, it's, it, it is a buzz, and I try to say, let's talk about it. What's uncomfortable for you? And, and let's get it out there, and have you told your student? Have you said this to your student? Because you can say it to me, but it's their college. Right. And are you helping or are you not helping? How's it going to go? What do you say, Erin, about this list of 
prestigious schools and top 25 this and 30 that. You know, I, I'm really glad you brought that question up, Michelle, because that's, that, that's the wrong question. That, that's, as, as Jody said, that's a buzz term. This is big college selling big education, and we know how much this thing costs now. We're, we're paying the equivalent of houses to send our kids to undergraduate at this point, we're talking big bucks. So this is a big thing for, for a lot of schools to go off of. But that's not the question. The question isn't what are the top 25 schools out there. The question is what does a student want to go to school for and what are the best schools in that particular discipline? Let's break that down. U.S. News World Reports and a lot of other organizations such as ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, or OATA, which uh, documents occupational therapists. What are they saying about the top programs in their particular fields? So that way we can go back and ask this question with our kids from the start. What is it that we're going to school for? What is it that we're getting ready to go do? Let's find the schools that are targeted and really strong in that particular area in order to find the right ranking system for that. And that's where we want to begin with. That's good. That's good. Um, um, uh, Joe, uh, this cut, Chris, uh, sorry, question calls from Chris. Uh, what happens if my child won't use the money from her 529 plan because she got a full scholarship? Well, uh, that's, that happens all the time. You save for college, and then uh, you get a maybe not a full scholarship, but a nice scholarship, and perhaps you have more money in your 529 than you need to pay for college. You have several choices at that point. Uh, number one, you can pull that money out of the 529 plan and not use it for college because you don't need to. Uh, in that case, it's, it's a non-qualified distribution. The earnings are subject to income tax, but it, they're not subject to the 10% penalty because there's a special exception called the scholarship exception that if you get a scholarship, you can pull that money out of your 529 plan without that 10% penalty. Uh, then the other thing you can do is uh, with your excess 529 money is retarget it for somebody else in the family, younger sibling perhaps, or even a future grandchild or great grandchild. There's no holding period or time limit in a 529 plan. So if you don't need that money and you just want it, want it to sit there growing tax deferred for future family generations, you can do that. And That's it's a good idea. Like for grandchildren, maybe. Pardon me? For grandchildren, maybe. Absolutely. For grandchildren that are, aren't even born yet. They'll be born sometime in the future, but uh, you have that money set aside for that, for that purpose. Uh, That's good. That's good. Yeah, so you do have some different options. I'm going to open this up to all of you. I'm not sure who might be the most appropriate. This comes from Blake. Um, I have heard life insurance is a good place to put money for college. Does the panel agree, disagree, and why? I'm going to tell you right now, I don't say no. <laughs> but Because mostly what you're talking about is whole life or some cash value policy. And lots of times the fees are too high for those for me. So I would, my vote is no. What about the rest of you guys? Well, I, I think would vote that, the, that advice probably came, that they probably came from someone who sells life insurance, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the reason that I hear most uh, often supporting that argument is because life insurance is not counted as an asset uh, for financial aid purposes, uh, which is true. Retirement assets, the equity in your home, they're not counted for financial aid purposes uh, along with life insurance. But I don't think that's a reason, a good reason to, to use life insurance because as you say, Michelle, there are a lot of fees and costs and, and risks associated with, with purchasing a life insurance policy. Maybe you should have life insurance for some other reason, but not, I don't think, not primarily as a, as a college savings tool. Right. And Aaron, you said no to? Yeah, same reasons. Joe hit it the nail on the head really with that. It's uh, the... the little bit of work that we've seen in this because our organizations were not financial advisors we worked strictly for the family and, and as arbiters of the deal of education but what we've seen from the uh, from the insurance vehicles that they're really pricey uh, they have a lot of uh, it's a lot to go into them and it's very difficult to really be able to use for college right. especially right. like yeah Jody do you have an yeah, opinion? I'm a no too. I'm a no too. Uh, oh. yeah. I'm, um, okay, so um, let's see. Let's go to Rob. Um, well, I guess this is sort of similar to the parent, uh, grandparents' question, but what, what about putting assets in parents' name rather than the child's name? 
Um, for me, I like to control the money because it's my money. So, you know, we created the 529 plans and we actually have money outside of 529 plans because we wanted some pockets of money that didn't have a lot of restrictions. And again, still saving it in our name because I want to control whether I use it for this kid or that kid or, you know, like for example, you can't use 529 plans to say buy a car. Uh, and my daughter need, wanted a car and we needed to help pick up her siblings. So we used some of them like so I, I put everything in my name. My husband and I have very, all the savings in our name. Well, what do you guys say? Uh, Aaron, what do you say? What are you seeing in your clients? Uh, well, for us, we really say that um, look at the best strategy for you as a family. It looks like in most cases it's best to put it in the parents' names. Again, we're not the financial advisors uh, of the world, but we do work with our FAs on this one. And in most cases, not every single one, because every family is a different case, but it looks like putting it with the parents' names is typically the best method. Right. What do you say, Joe? Well, for, for many years, uh, there's been an income tax play where parents can shift assets to their children and then have the investment earnings taxed at a zero or a very low tax rate because it's in their child's name. Uh, and then, uh, you know, along came the kitty tax many, many years ago. Uh, which taxes those earnings above a certain threshold at the parent's tax rate. So it, it sort of caps the, the income tax benefit that you can get by, by shifting assets into your child's name. And now that kitty tax ex has been expanded to include college students up to the age of 23. So it's, it's no longer where you escape the kitty tax once your child turns 14 the way it was a while back. It's now, in many cases, 23. And so you can only shelter about $2,000 a year in investment income in your child's name before being hit by this kitty tax or, or tax at the parent's rate. Uh, so that's one thing is, is, is the income tax benefit is fairly limited in doing that. And then there's the control aspect, as you mentioned, uh, Michelle, is, is once it's in your child's name, it has to be used for that child. It can't be used for anybody else in the family. And when that child hits a certain age set under state law, whether it's 18 or 21, that money belongs to the child directly. So they can, you know, when that child hits their 15th or 16th birthday and sees all that money that's awaiting them when they hit the age 18, they may start making pretty bad decisions right at, at, at that time. So you don't want to have a whole lot of money in there because of that. And finally, there's the financial aid reason for not putting a lot of money in your child's name, and that's because uh, assets in your, your child's name are counted more heavily than assets in the parent's name when it comes to uh, federal financial aid. Uh, right. it's, it's a pretty big difference. It's a 20% it's a assessment rate with a child's asset versus a 5.6% assessment rate for a parent's asset. Right. Well, that's good to know. This comes from Jim. Um, I have three children, ages 9, 7, and 3. So the first two will overlap in college, with the youngest following the second child, and affect one to two children in college over a 10-year period. Explanation point. Given the 529 beneficiary uh, can be changed, should I set up three accounts or two or one? Three accounts equal three annual fees possibly. On the other hand, pouring all that money into a super account may ding the oldest more since the account is bigger. Your thoughts? That's a really good question. I hadn't thought about that. I just set up three because I just, I mean, just it just seemed easier for me. I didn't mean, and the fees are actually pretty low. I mean, I don't, it doesn't, it wouldn't prevent me from setting up three. But what do you guys think? Let, um, Jody, do you? Um, yeah, I'm interested, Joseph. I, I need that answer. I, you know, <laughs> I'm throwing the ball. <laughs> Man, what what do you think? Three, <laughs> one, two. You want to follow Michelle's example and set up. Hey, Michelle. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> no, ding, ding, ding. Not not very many plans even have account fees anymore. I mean, they used to, but most of those uh, account maintenance fees have gone away. So you won't be paying multiple fees when you have multiple accounts simply because they don't have those annual maintenance fees anymore. Uh, the other reason is because you have children of different ages and you should be investing differently based on their age. So we talked about the age-based portfolios before. You're going to have a different age-based portfolio depending on you know which child that's for. And the final reason is because, you know, I would it's I would hate to be that that child that is not named on the account, and all these college statements are coming in every quarter from the 529 plan with my older 
brother or bro older sister's name on it. I'm thinking, well, my parents don't even want me to go to college because they haven't set up an account for me. So, so That's stay away. That's a really good point, Joe. Because my kids are, are actually competing. Like my youngest, she has a little bit more because her plan is a little bit more aggressive than her brother's, and so she'll go, "Well, I have, you know, whatever. I don't tell you how much it is. It's a lot." But she's like, "Well, I have this, and my brother has this," and they're like, "But I love it because they're talking about what we have saved for them." But there is a, some competition. I hadn't thought about that. That the, the, the uh, different investment strategies, because the closer they are, you don't want to be as um, uh, have as much in equities because they're going to need the money. That's a good point. What, what do you say, Aaron? Three, one, or and, two? And I would say three for sure, and I think this is more of, of a statement slash question for Joe. Isn't there a good tax benefit for state two also for the more oh, 529s right. you can set up on the state income tax? Well, it, yeah, in some states you can get more deductions because they cap their deduction per beneficiary. So absolutely, Aaron, you're correct. It depends on where you live. Uh, and there's also another reason when it comes to gift taxes because your contributions to a 529 plan are a gift from you to the beneficiary and you have a $14,000 annual exclusion per beneficiary. Well, if you're only using one of your children as beneficiary, you're effectively limited to $14,000 in annual contributions without getting into gift tax problems. But if you have three children, uh, what's that, uh, $48,000? I'm not even sure what the math is. Uh, Forty-two thousand uh, dollars. So you you basically expand your capacity to make contributions without gift tax problems if you if you open up three accounts as opposed to one. And yeah, see, that's why you had those thirty-four accounts. Plus, <laughs> I, <thought> <laughs> <laughs> I had I had accounts for myself. I had accounts for, for my wife. In fact, I'll tell you this story too because. Uh, uh, our children got through college, and, and like you, I had ex extra money in the 529. So I'm taking that money. I'm back in college myself. So I'm going to the community oh. college, and I'm taking classes in horticulture and conservation, and it's it's just wonderful. So I, I I'm I'm finding a good use for that excess 529 money. Oh, that's really good. That's good. I love it. Um, someone was um, challenging, I think a little bit of something that you said, Richard, you know you all got smart allergies on here, he says, well I thought there was a 30 year window to use the funds in the 529, though I know you can reassign the beneficiaries, but only for up to 30 years, correct? Does somebody know more than you, Joe? <laughs> There's one state, Virginia, that has a 30 year limit on their 529 plans. No other state has any sort of limit on on the length of, 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 of your account. So I don't know why Virginia set that limit, but it's in their law. Uh, so if you're investing in uh, actually the, the, the country's largest 529 plan is a, is a broker sold plan out of Virginia called College America. So mm -hmm. if you're thinking about that plan, yes, there is a 30 year um, limit on that particular plan. Okay, so Richard, that was only a 5% gotcha on Joe. <laughs> um, hey, uh, Aaron, this is a good question from Mary. I just sent the question in earlier. My daughter turns 18 in February, and we have about nine grand saved. Any advice? Well, I think uh, she's 18, and it sounds like she's one of her senior. I think this is the time to really just start looking and seeing how we're we best going to spend that money. If it's only nine grand, that's fine. I'm, I'm sure all of us have run into families with. $200,000 saved and zero saved for college. The truth is you treat it basically in the same way. You start with the same buying mechanisms in the sense of what am I going to school for? What am I actually going to be going to do? Let's find the schools to do that well and still shop for it in the same way. Now that may say that you may have to put in more debt. We may have to find schools that do have higher endowments, higher outputs and scholarship money on per capita uh, per student. That's where we really want to start. Stretch that money out. Make sure you can use it wisely still. Right, right, right. What do you say about that, Jody? I'm going to reach for something. I'm going to show you all something. Oh, uh, I mean, you know, 9000 so if you take a typical California school, tuition is 5000 right? So, you know, a lot of students will try to stay in state. Um, you also need to talk to your student about, you know, it's a four-year plan or maybe it's a five-year plan. So maybe what Aaron is saying, so is community college part of your conversation? Is that two years going to save you money? Um, you know, is that four-year experience gonna, important to the student in a state school or a public school or a private school? I think all of these conversations 
flush out and you need to apply for financial aid. So um, we don't want to say um, miss that opportunity. You need to know your deadlines. You need to know that the FAFSA goes live January 1st every year. If your student is going to go to private for whatever reasons, like Erin was saying, it's a career move or an undergraduate move in that sense, you know, do you need to have, fill out the CSS profile, which is a college board application that goes live on October 1st. So uh, making sure that you, though you're at the kitchen table having those conversations, this is how much I have. I have nine thousand. So what you know, what can we do as a family to make that work to achieve our goals? Whether we're going to be a doctor or a painter, right? I love that. Early to everything. Early to everything. Like Early to admissions right. and money. Go ahead. I'd like to ask because Jody mentioned uh, community college. And I think more and more people are recognizing the option of spending two years at community college and then transferring to a four-year school for that four-year degree, which okay. is very intriguing, and I think it's probably very effective. But I'd like to hear from Erin, who's, who's working with a lot of families, about that strategy. Is it, is it really a, a good strategy that you find works for some of your clients? Absolutely. The 100% the answer is absolutely. Now, that what we do find is every kid is completely different. Everybody has a different path of this. In fact, we we really like to talk to college for like let's start with the basics. There's seven versions of even what we call higher education. We just typically focus on this one. We typically focus on this four year public. When there's four year public, there's four year private. There's liberal art. There's art. There's tech. There's community. There's trade. Mm -hmm. Every student is different in how they actually will go into figuring out which solution or which situation is right for them. So is there one fit all for the community college answer? Not at all. But for a lot of students, that is finding uh, that that is a way that a lot of kids are finding their ways. Two major universities that get the same degree that they would have gotten if they would have spent the twenty to fifty thousand dollars a year in their freshman and sophomore year, where in the first two years they may only be spending four. Again, it's different for every student, especially on the maturity side, whether or not they're ready to move to a full four-year campus, live on campus, live in the dorms of all that. Or is it better for them to stay at home, take that first step, really start working from that perspective? Every family is different. I think that's a really, really good point, Aaron. Um, and uh, because my son has autism, and it goes back to that whole question about the list of colleges, and there's all this pressure. And I have to tell you, I was succumbing to it. My son is very bright, um, honest student, but he's got autism, which comes with you know challenges. And I just was like, oh, we got to get them in this school. And then I'm figuring out how we're going to get tutors and, you know, all kinds. I mean, it was really stressful. And finally, my husband said, he's just not ready yet. And there's this sense of, did I fail? Because I cannot tell all the parents he's going to community college. That, you know, I mean, he's like, community college. Oh, you know. And there's just this. Mm -hmm. But if I only have $9,000 and my kid can go to community college, stay at home, or commute, you know, why are we putting all this pressure on ourselves where each kid is different? And I'm, I'm going to be out there. I'll take this on me. I don't think you should accumulate any debt for college. That's me. That's how I preach. And that's what I preach for folks because uh, I see the, the end result of all these people with a lot of debt. Uh, so I'm anti-debt, and I know I'm way out there on that. But if you all could, could sort of address this whole issue, because a lot of people who are watching now, um, and it, just the fact that they're in this forum afternoon, you know, where I was trying to work to spend an hour to talk about this kind of thing, there's a lot of pressure to go to that four-year, go away, stay on campus. When, as you say, Erin, you've got to look at different, there's different ways to go to college, and maybe we are not, somehow we're not getting that message out. What, what do you say, Jody? And then I want to hear what, what Joseph has to say. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you, Michelle. I feel when I have a family call on the phone, I think probably the first thing, and I've mentioned this before since we've been, since we've been here with you know everyone who's watching, that... Um, it's your job to put your blinders on, put your head down, and do what's best for your family, and not look around the community, and not look behind everyone else's door, because you don't know what's behind everyone's door. They may seem one way on the outside, but it's another way on the inside. We don't know everyone's tax return. We don't know what people have saved, so you need to do. And I say gold star, Michelle, for the fact that, you know, 
you, you just want to do what's best for your student. That's what's best. So going to a four-year school is maybe not the best. Going to community college is might be the best. Going to night school, uh, you know, and knowing your student well enough to give them permission to do that. And so Aaron Harvard, when I go to the parent meeting and everybody's like, well, my kid got in Harvard and they got in Cornell. And I'm like, well, my kid going to community college. I mean, how do you not, you know, do that? Because there is, come on now, all of you who are parents, you all know, at the PTA meeting in April or May when those uh, exceptions come in, everybody's like wearing where their kids going to college on their chest. And it, there is this pressure. You know, and then I feel like I have to explain why he's going to community college, which I don't. I shouldn't have to. So what what would you say about that? Because I think that would really help. I mean, we got we're gonna get to more of your specific questions, but I, I think we do need to spend just a little bit of time talking about this because this this is what leads to people making bad college choices that cost them debt for decades. Amen, amen. And this is the problem. And this, I'm glad you took this take Michelle because. This is where we are with this topic. We've got to change the conversation here. We're now looking at a cost that's going to be equivalent of a house for every student, and we're just talking undergrad. This is the first major decision, first major economic financial decision a kid, a student, your child is making in their life. They're going to buy houses, they're going to get married, they'll have kids, get retirement, they'll buy retirement. If we don't start putting in the right principles now, into how to actually invest in something, and particularly in themselves. And us as parents, being able to hold back and say, I'm not just buying a brand name, I'm buying the right situation for my child to get them ready for the next love full, then I don't know what else to say. That's where this conversation has become. Anytime anybody walks up to you and says, you need to spend sixty to $70,000 on this a year, you better believe they mean business. And we've got to mean it back. This is a debt conversation. This is a cost conversation. Our, we have a very strict rule for debt in our house, and it's as a student, you should take on no more than half of your anticipated annual salary in debt based off of the future career path that you choose. And that's where we begin. That's our line of descent, and the, the goal is to work our way backwards. I personally was very fortunate. I graduated with $40,000 to the good after graduating from college, and it changed the world for me in that situation. That's where we want to begin with this conversation, and that's where we've got to shift it to. Let's put it centrally on the student helping them find their path and matching the cost structure up so that way we're buying this and that's the key term buying this education properly in this day and age I like that buying this education buying this education uh, properly is that what you said right what's right. up Joe what, what do you say this and then I'm gonna uh, go to Shola's question about some good websites I'm gonna go to you Jody I know you got some questions <laughs> what do you think Joe Michelle I'm just happy that my kids both made it through college and uh, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> probably should have used someone like Jody or Aaron to help us uh, chart their ways, and because neither one of our kids really is working in the field that they went to college mm -hmm. for, and I think that's fairly common. Uh, I know some parents will say, "Well, I'm going to do my best getting them through undergraduate school. Then, if they want to go to graduate school, pick their particular field. You know, that's their decision. That's their money. It's their obligation. You know." God bless them. Uh, so I, I, I hear that quite a lot, but uh, but yeah, there's a, there's just a lot of thought that can go into it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 we could go on forever about that whole sec. I like this part about because I personally um, have committed to our children, my husband and I, that we're going to help them through grad school as well. I don't understand this sort of like, oh, they on their own. These are little people who, for like the last 18 years, did not have a job. If I'm if I'm correct, right? I don't know about your kids. My kids are not very talented. They didn't tap dance or sing or anything, so, or play. They don't have any. So how do you just say, "Oh, they on their own"? That means basically taking on debt because where would they get the money to pay for grad school? But that's another conversation. So, Chuck, that's um, an old mentality. That's an old mentality. I'm gonna take that on. Yeah, I mean, I just I, I get that you want them to have a stake in the game. I get that a lot of parents will say. They need to pay so they can, you know, have some skin in the game is what they say. Uh, but that's very expensive skin, and they're going to get scalped. And uh, I just think that you, you, you had them. We know what it costs to do what we need to do as a career. And so why would you say it's on them? That's crazy to me. But that's me. So, uh, so I'm going to uh, go, what are some of the best websites out there when you are searching for scholarships and grants? It's a good question. 
Um, I I like lots of different scholars. Well, first of all, I love Google. That's the first thing. So you can Google anything. I step on my toes every morning and breathe air to the east, and you can find me a scholarship for that. So um, I would use Google as your friend. Um, I do like Fast Web and Chegg. Um, I um, also uh, like scholarship.com. Um, and I'm, I'm really big about telling my families. Um, I have these two students who come every week now. And uh, the one girl created her own business. And she created her own t-shirts. And she's creating videos on GoPro of her surfing. And so she's now looking for photography and video, um, not through any site, just, you know, through foundations and stuff like that. So try to narrow down your search so that you're in your own community, because once you go global, you're competing against more people. So the narrower you can get, and it's not about the dollar amount, it's about how many you apply for. So it's more like 50 and 60 versus the $50,000 scholarship. Right. That's good. That's good. Um, Joe or Aaron, maybe you can answer this from um, Sean. Our income has recently increased as my freelance consulting business has grown. However, there is no guarantee from one year to the next as to what our income will be. Is this type of situation covered under the CSS profile? Net price calculator suggesting we can afford $70,000 which isn't realistic at all since I stayed home with my kids for several, since I stayed home with my kids for several years when they were younger hampering our ability to save. So, I would say that's completely unrealistic from the start because there's no way anybody should pay $70,000 for the education because it's not valued at that. The education for the kid is just not going to be worth that much coming out. But I'm going to let Joe answer that more on the tactical side. So how do you how do you do when you have irregular income like that? Oh, I, I think, you know, colleges may not want to admit it, but financial aid is negotiable. Uh, so the first response they give you is not necessarily the final response. And if your child is uh, desired by several colleges and basically has colleges competing to get that child into their, into their, um, into their school, they're going to be willing to take a look at your situation, maybe a little bit harder, than for a child who is sort of on the edge of getting into that school. And so if you have, you know, inconsistent earnings, you know, that's an excuse that the school will take into account if they're looking for excuses to give your child a better package. So so absolutely take it take it to the college and see what they'll see what they'll do for you. Right. Um, Joe, this is another 529 question from Tim. What is the best plan for 529 withdrawals for non-custodial parents to not affect FAFSA? Well, the, the best strategy is to wait until the final year of the student's college career before using that 529 money, taking it out to pay for that, uh, for that student. That way it will not affect financial aid. Uh, but if the money is withdrawn and used to support the student before that in, a, in, a, in an earlier year, then it does have to be counted as student income on the next year's financial aid application. So if you can wait, hold off until the final year, um, that's better. If you can't hold off because that money is needed right now for the first or second year of college, then perhaps think about transferring those funds into the parent's name or transferring the 529 account into the parent's name. Uh, the parents will now have control of the, that money, but it will be treated differently and probably more advantageously for financial aid purposes. Right, okay. Um, this is from Deborah. I have five kids. Oh, bless your heart. I have three and they kill me. Uh, how can I save for them all? So Aaron, how can they save for, how can she save or he save for all? I would just say do the best you can. Just do the best you can. Don't overextend yourself. Live for what you have to. Still save. Saving is always the most important piece. But just look, uh, do what we kind of described earlier. Open five, 529 plans. At this point, probably if you're just starting from scratch, distribute evenly. And do something that you know you can do in the same way that you're doing for retirement. And then work on the back end once we get to that point when that first student enters school and start working on getting the school, a student in the right schools. And I love what Joe said because it's absolutely true. Negotiate the heck out of financial aid. This is why here at Liftoff we study the numbers so heavily because we know what they're working with. 
So if they if the school is under evaluating or under uh, under bidding, so to speak, a student on financial aid, we can call them out on it, and we can say, okay, this is where your average package looks like. We know this student needs to be here based off of their budget. Meet us that way, or we have five of, five other schools in tow that we're working with that can do it too. Uh, that actually worked for me. My daughter, um, she we have all her money, but uh, she didn't get. Initially, they didn't say they wanted to give her money, and we called all the back. Was like, "Yo, so this is a really bright kid, and you definitely want her mama <laughs> to come along with her." Uh, and then she did; she got some extra money, which is greatly helping us and going to leave money for graduate school. So, Jody, this comes from Molly. Um, what's the best option for low-income people with little to save and not much time in terms of programs that are available? So uh, is the question asking, you know, what's the best option for higher education? Are we, you know, community college we talked about earlier and transferring. Um, a lot of community colleges have honors programs, so if there's not a lot, I would use that two-year program, hard and heavy, like jo Joe talked about. And then if, if that um, private school is in your realm, then maybe that school, if you apply for financial aid, will give you financial aid because you are eligible so completing the forms correct on time is is very important so that you are awarded the money that you are eligible for I was even thinking that 70,000 um, example parent that you talked about earlier you know is that night net price calculator even right it did right. is it back-ended links that maybe aren't right and so maybe she didn't get or he didn't get a good adjustment on that so calling your financial aid officers they are, they want to, you know, they will chat. I would, they are your friend for four years, so you really need to have a conversation and try not to, to be afraid of them because um, they're going to tell it like it is. It might not be the way you want it, but we're going to tell you the truth. Right, right. Erin, is there a lot of money? There's, there's this whole controversy about there, you know, if you're poor, you get a lot of money. Is that true? Oh, well, actually, let's break this down from the economic levels that we can look at. We can look at low income, middle class, and higher income, and there are financial strategies for how to approach colleges in every single category, and it's different for everyone. Interestingly enough, the lower income folks, you know what the schools that are most affordable for them are the Harvards, Cornells, right. Penns. Yeah. We can look at them. They have 100% need met in full in most cases. Their endowment sizes are in the billions with only a few thousand students. They can afford it, and they do pretty regularly. So looking and seeing what the financials are for especially low-income families is extremely important. And actually what Jody said is, too, making sure everything's done on time and everything is properly in order. There is no holding back a low-income student. So long as the grades are there and everything else are there, you just have to find the right schools that academically and financially, especially financially, really can make that work. They're out there. What if you're a low-income student and your grades are decent but not great? You you know, you did, I mean, we sort of expect everybody to be a 4.0, but everybody, that's not, that, that's not their gifting. You know, they're a good student, but not, they can't get into Harvard to get the free money, but they're a good student. Um, are there still a lot of options for them for financial aid? I mean, there's Publix, you know, I, I think there's a lot of Publix that are out there that are really going to give a lot of money, and I think there's one thing that we haven't touched about, I mean, we did talk about applying and stuff, but if a, if you are in a low-income family, if you are a low-income family, there's verification, and I'm not sure we've touched about that, but that is something the media does not talk about, there's something that people don't talk about, verification is huge, so filling out the forms on time, making sure that you get all the information in, but then colleges are going to want you to prove that everything you filled out is correct and they're going to need backup information on that. And that is just as key in ASAP as the other information. So make sure that if you're a family and you're not sure how the whole process is going to work, you have to finish it until that bill comes. Keep going and going and going. And even this year, I would say most of my families are being verified late. So it can go all the way till September. So keep an eye on that. I, I can't stress that enough. So making sure you get that paperwork in. Did you want to add something, Aaron? Oh, oh I was okay. going to say, use that as a negotiating piece, too. Absolutely. Because uh, I'll use a good example. Um, we're in Columbus, Ohio. Ohio State is actually my alma mater. When we're working with them, let's say we have a family, and EFC is an important number for low-income families. Let's say your EFC is zero. Then you're going to get the max Pell Grant. But also, Ohio State in particular, like a lot of other public schools that Jody was saying, 
has what they call a grant pro uh, program. They call it the Scholar and Grant Program. They'll add four to five thousand dollars to it, depending on what your EOC is. So right there, between the Pell Grant and what Ohio State's going to give you, that's nine grand off the top. That's mm -hmm. pretty much covering tuition. Then we just have room and board. We can find some other ways to do that too. Right. And to your point about room and board, listen, um, that may mean your kid can't stay on campus. Um, and I think you need to think about that. We we sort of think about the traditional college experience, but especially if you got to borrow, because you're eventually borrowing for rent and food. So yeah, you want them out the house. They probably want to be out the house. But if you don't have it, I would rather you see the person commute and get a college education than struggle and uh, um, take on debt, especially since lots of minority students end up taking on the debt and not getting that degree. Um, um, Joe, you've been way too quiet, so I got to come to you. We got. I'm gonna lump two questions that came in. One was from Ed. Um, are laptop purchases a qualified expense? And I think I had a question. I can't see who the person's name was. Wanted to know can they buy a car for their kid with 529 plans? So laptop and car. Can you get it with 529 money? The answers are no and no. <laughs> <laughs> laptop computers are only qualified if the school requires that your student have a laptop computer coming coming to college. And some schools do require that, in which case it would be a qualified expense. But but the majority of schools do not have that explicit requirement. There's a there's a law, a bill pending in Congress that would make computer technology a qualified expense, and it makes sense because students really do need this, even if the school doesn't explicitly require it. So. I think that will pass before too long, but it hasn't passed yet. And transportation of any sort is not a qualified expense. So buying your child a car or even paying for you know, bus tickets to go back and forth to school or even going abroad to, to, to college and, and having to, to buy plane fare would not be a qualified expense. Oh, that's good because my daughter's going to study abroad. I'm so Darn it, I got to that playing fair. Um, Joe, one that question, and then um, I see we've got about three minutes left to go. Um, great conversations, guys, I, and I know we had hundreds more questions, but I tried to pick some that kind of covered a lot, because a lot of your questions were similar. Uh, so if I didn't call out your name. Hopefully we got to the crux of what you were asking. So, Joe, are there any 529 plans to stay away from when saving for college? To stay away from? I, I would say no. I mean, the, the states are very competitive, and so they've all really put a lot of effort into making their 529 plans really good plans. There are a range of fees in different 529 plans, so some states are able to offer a lower cost plan than other states, so you do want to be aware of the fees. You want to be aware of the state tax deduction situation and how best to take uh, advantage of, of that. So. Uh, you know, there's also prepaid tuition plans out there which are fundamentally different than these 529 savings plans, even though they are 529 plans as well. Uh, if, if you're thinking about a prepaid tuition plan, it's a whole different set of financial yeah. considerations in, in choosing a, a prepaid plan and deciding to do that um, uh, instead of a 529 savings plan or even in addition to a 529 savings plan. So I won't go into any of the real you know, peculiarities of, of prepaid tuition plans. And there's plenty on um, savingforcollege.com um, about prepaid. I, I tend not to like them because if your kid doesn't go in-state, the rate of return is, is not great. Uh, and so I, I like the, the savings, the investment one. It's sort of more like, you know, you save for 401k, but that's not my personal opinion. As you can see, I don't shy from sharing my personal opinion. <laughs> so we've got just a minute left. Um, I want to wrap it up by, uh, I'm going to announce the winner, and then I want to, each of you, if you don't mind, just some parting um, comments, and also where people can reach out to you, either on your website or personally if they've got some follow-up questions. Again, I know we didn't get to you know the hundreds of questions, but I think we covered a lot of the major ground. Uh, and between Joe's website, my column, Jody's information, and Aaron, 
there's still plenty of information out there, uh, and we're just grateful that you joined us. And you did the right thing by trying to find out more information before you spend your hard-earned dollars. Uh, so um, let's talk about the winner real quick. So the winner for the Kindle Fire, I tried to keep it for myself, I'm just going to be honest, <laughs> um, is Camille Davison. Camille, I hope you're still on it, so you're somehow doing a little dance. Um, and we will be in contact with you to give you that Kindle Fire. I'm so jealous. Um, so anyway, I want to ask each of our panelists to wrap up with some quick comments because I see we're right at 2.30, so make it quick if you guys don't mind. Um, let's start with Aaron. Um, just, you know, some words of encouragement to folks as they continue in this process. I would say just change the conversation at home. Make this a less of an emotional decision about picking a college and make it more of a tactical, logical one off of this is what I want to invest in in my future. This is how I want to take this as a family, as a student and you'll have a much better experience with it. That's something we work on every day here, is making just good, logical, well-based decisions, academically and financially. That's great. Oh, and our website is collegeofthought.com. Say it again. Our website, if you'd like to reach out to us, is www.collegeliftoff.com. Collegeliftoff.com. OK, Jody, real quick for me. Um, please keep all the doors open apply for everything apply on time apply early those doors will shut on their own so you keep them open until they shut on their own and you can find me at college financial aid advisors or tweet me jody oaken i like that oh i should have mentioned guys tweet i'm singletary m and aaron are you on twitter or facebook yeah we're on facebook and just look us up at college liftoff and we'll be right okay. there and Joe, you're the man. We gotta end with you. <laughs> Any words of encouragement? Uh, yeah, it's 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 all it's all possible. Uh, no matter how uh, challenging it looks, uh, I would I would uh, suggest that everyone you know get that 529 account open with the minimum at least 25 dollars per month. You you should be able to afford that, even if you haven't fully funded your retirement plan, which is an important goal too. Uh, Get something set up for 529s in college, and then as time goes goes by, maybe you can uh, put more money into that. But you'll you'll be very glad that you did. Yeah, I agree. Listen, my I know that lots of people are trying to figure out: should I put in my name, my grandparents' name? What should I do? 529, prepaid, all this. You know, listen, just save, okay? Uh, because at the end of the day, all this trying to finagle it and figure out an angle. Really, you just want your kid to go to college to get a good college education with no debt so they can get out of your house. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for this webcast. Uh, thanks to Aaron and Jody and Joseph at SavingForCollege.com. Uh, we, uh, I totally enjoyed myself. I hope you did, and I'm sure we'll be doing some more of these. Uh, and just, just say, folks, just say. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.